Hello, welcome to the White House, and thank you very much for taking the time to join us for this very special conversation this afternoon about the implementation of Wall Street reform. My name is Corey Elons, and I'm the Director of African American Media here at the White House, and we're going to have a good conversation today, uh, engaging in a live chat with you, our viewers, as well as uh, partners who've agreed to join us today for this very special conversation. Here with us from the White House, to my immediate left, is Dr. Cecilia Rouse, who is with the Council of Economic Advisors. Uh, starting from the far end, we have Casey Gain McCullough, who is a contributor to Jack and Jill Politics and from News One. We also have uh, John Simons, who is the uh, personal finance director for blackenterprise.com. And then finally, uh, we have Dr. Wilmer Leon of the uh, of the griot.com, who is also a professor of political science at Howard University. Now, the way this is going to work today is we will uh, take questions from you all, but we also have questions that have been submitted to us earlier from our partners uh, over the course of the past several days. We'll have a series, uh, one round of questions from each of them, and then we'll be taking questions from you. Uh, thanks again for joining us, and with that, we'll turn it over to Dr. Rouse. Thank you very much, Corey, and thank you all for joining us today. It's really a pleasure to be here to talk about this very important piece of legislation, which was passed into law last month. I think before we really begin to talk to, about the legislation specifically, it's important to remember how we got here. It was not quite two years ago when the financial system was just on the verge of a great meltdown. This was during the end of the Bush administration, and we had uh, banks which had many troubled assets on their balance sheets, largely fueled by the subprime mortgage crisis, uh, so largely fueled by the housing crisis. And it really looked as though uh, if there was not government assistance, there would just be massive failure within the financial system. And so the federal government took steps which were not popular. It did not want to do it. Uh, but were very necessary in order to stabilize the financial system at that time, which was by setting up the Travel As Troubled Assets Relief Program, um, known as TARP. Uh, so when President Obama took office, uh, he actually uh, received additional funds for TARP. He did not want to do so, but he also understood that if we wanted to stabilize our economy, it was important to stabilize the financial system. And this decision was actually reaffirmed recently with a study by two economists which suggested that the, the collection of actions that the federal government took, including the stabilization of the financial sector, uh, what the federal, the federal Reserve actions, and importantly, the um, American Recovery and Reinvestment Act did as well, uh, really helped to stabilize the system that we had uh, saved 8.5 million jobs on top of the 8 million jobs that were lost in a, um, anyway. So we really uh, avoided a, a meltdown as a result. Okay, so we had uh, the Wall Street bailout, which we felt was an unpopular uh, medicine to take in order to stabilize the system. But really, in the process of uh, going through that crisis, we really understood the ways in which the financial system had outgrown the regulatory system that was overseeing it. The regulatory system had roots that went back to the Great Depression, and the reality was that the financial instruments that were being used and the way that, the, that financial products were being marketed, et cetera, had just outgrown this regulatory structure. And so it was important to step back and understand and to develop it and to ex uh, improve the regulatory structure to, uh, to, 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 um, to basically advance to the modern world. And that is what the president signed into law last month. So what does this new law do? For one, we understood uh, almost two years ago that there were financial institutions that were just too big to fail, that we could not let them fail without them bringing down the entire economy. And so uh, this, this legislation makes it no longer possible for financial institutions to become so big that they cannot be undone, unwound in a way uh, that will uh, bring down the rest of the economy. It also brought into the light new financial instruments that had become so exotic that many of the traders didn't understand what they were investing in, um, and brings them out of the shadows and requires that they be traded out in the open and with new transparency. Importantly, it also says that banks can no longer have some money in one pocket that's guaranteed by the other, and then they're gambling with that money out of the other pocket um, by drawing a, a bright line between those activities. And finally, and what we're really here to talk about today, is it brought much more uh, authority and oversight to help uh, protect the consumer. 
So it does this uh, primarily by creating a new Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which I will refer to as the Bureau today. And this Bureau is there to help you and to help, to all, really to help all of us to uh, bring more oversight to financial institutions that are providing loans and other activities, uh, to bring, um, uh, again, more oversight there, and also to help uh, simplify loan, uh, loans and other um, uh, uh, documents so that I know many of you, if you've, if you've apply, ever applied for a mortgage, you know there are multiple forms and you have to read the fine print and you pretty much have to have been to law school and probably have an MBA in order to understand what you're signing away as you sign on the dotted line. So the, the purpose of the Bureau is to simplify that process and many other documents as well so that you understand what you're getting into. And it's there to promote financial literacy. So again, we have we, we bring the knowledge as we are uh, negotiating with lenders and, and making these financial decisions in order to make the de best decisions for us. So with that, I think uh, this, this law is really important. I'm very excited to, for us to talk about uh, many other aspects of it today. And I guess I'll close with that. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Dr. Rouse. And so we will start with the questions that were submitted to us earlier in the week with uh, Dr. Leon from uh, the GRIO giving us his first question. We have a question from uh, Christy Robinson who asks, what does the reform mean for a single parent like herself who's struggling more than ever because the economy is so bad? Working almost seems like a waste of time if you can't make it through till month end. Boy, I really do feel Christie's pain. And um, I have to say that I think it's actually in these economic times uh, that this kind of reform is more important than ever. Because you know, when you're getting by, there are lots of ways that you have to manage your finances. For example, if you get to the end of the month and you're not sure you can pay those bills, payday lenders look very attractive and may be, just provide the liquidity and the, the cash that you need to get to the next month. Uh, or maybe that you, you hit the end of your check your checking account and you, you, bounce, you bounce a check. Um, so what this new bill says is one, is for the very first time, payday lenders will be regulated. Payday lenders play a very important role in, in many communities, uh, but we also know that many of them are engaging in abusive practices. We know that they draw customers in and customers are trapped there. Um, the interest rates they're charging are 400 to 900 percent on an annualized basis, uh, which is astronomical. And uh, the purpose of the new bureau will be to make sure that th those lenders are available and that they're there, uh, but that they are not engaging in these abusive practices. It also will be enforcing the new credit card law that uh, President Obama signed earlier, which says things like credit card companies can't increase interest rates um, on existing balances. So when you're just getting by and you've got a balance on that credit card, the credit card camp company can't increase the cost of that even further. Uh, by increasing your rates. So this bill actually, especially with the, the, the Bureau, and, and I might also add by, uh, you know, when you're just getting by, understanding your choices and the implications of those choices is never more important. And so the financial literacy programs that the Bureau will be um, instituting and standing up, I think, uh, will really empower all of us to make better choices. Gentlemen, anything to add to that? Any other thoughts on that? Well, I, I think budgeting, the. Uh, getting your right. credit card statement and knowing for the first time exactly how long it's going to take you to pay, pay off, off that balance will help you budget. Yep. And when you can budget, you're, the more information you have and the better, you, the better able you are to budget, the better control you can have over your, over your decisions and, and make better decisions. Okay. We had a, a similar question which talks about um, payday loan sharks operate on every corner of every town, prey on mostly poor people taking 400 to 700% interest on loans, so no more of those interest on loans? What uh, the, the Bureau will be doing is uh, ensuring that those payday lenders aren't, abu aren't engaging in the most abusive practices. Payday lenders will always charge higher interest rates than, other, than your credit card, than your bank, because they're taking uncollateralized loans and they're taking higher risk. However, it's really important that, it, that consumers have all the information and they understand very much what they're getting into and that they have ways to pay off those loans in, in a reasonable amount of time. So, but what about, the, was there going to be a cutoff? Like 400 is extremely high. Uh, I completely agree with you, uh, certainly <laughs> as, a, as an individual. Um, you, you know, one of the things about this bill is it puts a lot of power in the hands of the Bureau, and the Bureau is, um, you know, is still being stood up. And okay. 
Absolutely. And just want to remind everyone, uh, go ahead and send in your questions to us. We are eager to take those as we engage in our conversation today. And uh, we'll continue on now with John Simons from Black Enterprise. So related to um, what we just discussed, a lot of people in our Black Enterprise audience want to know whether financial institutions will be held to, to task for, um, for targeting minorities for, some, for certain uh, subprime loan products and, and certain other um, you know, debt products. Um, are there going to be protections, specific protections, for minorities who, who may feel targeted by, by uh, lending institutions? I, I think the predatory lending practices with the subprime mortgages that uh, really precipitated and were a lot of the undercurrent of this current financial crisis really came to light and is, I think, a large part of the motivation for the consumer pieces of, the, of this legislation. And so absolutely, the new bureau will have expanded authorities to uh, prevent the sale of abusive products in the first place and to go after fraudulent lenders. Uh, will subprime mortgages still exist? Absolutely. I think they serve a useful purpose for those individuals that have less than stellar credit ratings, don't qualify for a regular mortgage. A subprime, a subprime mortgage can be a way to actually rebuild a credit history um, and, and then convert after a couple of years to a regular mortgage. Uh, but in the meantime, it's important that, the, that they not be abusive, that they not be targeted. There were individuals who qualified for prime mortgages who were, who were sold subprime mortgages, and that's absolutely, uh, the Bureau can actually stop those sorts of practices. At the same time, it's important for the individuals to be educated to understand what they're getting into um, when they sign on the dotted line. Which I, so I think it's very important that the financial literacy piece is there as well. With the financial literacy piece, is there, will there be any sort of recommendations to maybe teach economics or finance to, to children starting in elementary school? I mean, where does it, where does this, uh, where does this all begin? Or is that, or is that all being discussed now? Uh, I have to tell you, um, so that the Bureau is still being designed, uh, but I have to tell you that financial literacy starting in kindergarten um, is and in the earliest grades is a very high priority for Secretary Duncan, our Secretary of Education. And he is very committed to financial literacy at the various early, earliest grades and actually has exper experience having implemented such programs in elementary schools. And this is also in addition to financial literacy programs that are already ongoing within the federal government. Uh, Money Smart is a program that's been developed and designed by the FDIC that's currently in the way. It's uh, been very popular and successful across the country, so this agency, once it's stood up, will, will have a tremendous power to inform consumers about what their rights and, and, and abilities are. Will there be a website or in the making that could kind of, you know, a financial literacy education website where people can learn about um, mortgages, credit ratings, things that will affect them in the future? Because a lot of people make mistakes when they're young, and they don't know about the stuff, and then they find themselves in a credit trap by the time they're in their 20s. I completely, I certainly don't want to speak to the Bureau, which hasn't been stood up, but that certainly sounds like it would be among the, the, the ideas that they would be looking at. What is the timetable for when it will be uh, stood up? So the, uh, the Secretary, of, the way the legislation is structured is the Secretary of the Treasury uh, is to put it in process and to uh, assume the powers and then transfer the powers as the Bureau is set up. And uh, they are already underway doing so. Uh, they have set very aggressive timelines. This is a priority of the administrations. They have 30, 60, 90 day goals. They've already started putting in process. The, the, the whole genius behind the, the Bureau is that the consumer protection exists in a lot of agencies, but it becomes a residual responsibility of each of these agencies as opposed to being the primary responsibility of any one of them. And so when they have other competing demands, the consumer protection piece kind of, uh, can, can, fall, can lag. Um, and so uh, what they'll be doing is transferring authorities, transferring staff uh, to put together and consolidate all of that within the Bureau and all of that is, is in motion. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Wilma, why don't you give us your next question? We have a question from Cheryl Richardson uh, along the same lines of, of what we've just been talking about. While the banks now have new rules to live by, it seems as though they will continue to stiff customers with hidden fees of some sort. How will the reform bill protect us so that we are not being penalized now or when the banks decide to implement new fees? Uh, Cheryl, that's, that's a really important question as well. And I, and I think it goes to 
Um, one of the challenges in a law like this and when you're doing any kind of regulation like this, which is that right now we can see and we know what the banks were doing, but banks and their staff are very creative and they will be thinking of the next thing, which we may not have thought of today. And so one of the important parts of consolidating the powers and, and the focus on consumer protection within, within one agency is they will be on the lookout for new kinds of abusive practices, new kinds of ways of deceiving the customer, and they will have the authority to stop that without having, go to, having to go to Congress. Um, they will have the authority to, um, uh, to, to stop those abusive practices right then and there. Um, so I, I think that that's, you know, it's that, and then also making sure that consumers uh, have the information they need. Part of that is with forms where the, those deceptive practices aren't in that, you know, two, that size two font uh, where you need a telescope. Is that big? It's that big, right? <laughs> you need a telescope to be able to read it. Um, and so making sure that the information is clear, that you understand, you know, that the consumer understands the fees and the conditions for the loans and other the terms for bank accounts and other financial instruments and uh, that they have the financial literacy from the very beginning uh, to be able to, to understand what the implications are. When you talk about regulation, what is the, what is the or else part of this? I mean, when you, when you tell the banks that they can't do these things, what is the, what's the, um, you know, what are the penalties? Uh, is it sort of putting the bank out of business? Is it uh, telling them to cease business for a certain amount of time? Um, or is that still being worked out? I, I believe that is still being worked out, yeah. but I do know that they will be able to end abusive practices, which would mean just, you may not put the bank out of businesses, but you can say that transaction cannot go through. Um, and also to go after fraudulent lenders with whatever authorities they've been given. And we're gonna take a moment to take one of our uh, questions from online from Gina, who is writing in from South Carolina. She says that, uh, I'm doing well, I'm holding on to my home and we're doing fine, but uh, many of my neighbors have lost their homes and we are struggling to keep our neighborhood intact. Is there anything that's happening in this legislation or anything else uh, going on with the administration that, that is helping us with this mm. issue? Uh, boy, this is, this is the, a, a lingering problem and an e a lingering economic challenge as we're fighting our way through this recovery. Uh, I think we all know that the, the way that this will really turn around is when Americans are back to work and are earning an income and, and can stay in their homes. But in the meantime, the administration definitely is committed to helping with uh, folks who are uh, facing foreclosure and those who are in their homes and whose neighborhoods they find that their, their neighborhood is sort of deteriorating around them. So first of all, the, the, as part of the Recovery Act, and even subsequently the President has supported a continuation of this program, there's a Neighborhood Stabilization Fund, which is funds that goes to neighborhoods to help uh, prop up the property values, re renovate homes and other buildings which have been foreclosed on and have been abandoned so that uh, those abandoned properties and those homes aren't bringing down the property values for everybody else, therefore creating a spiral downwards. Um, the, pro, the, the administration also has uh, several programs to help uh, individuals who are facing foreclosure. The largest and best well known is the Home, uh, the home Affordable Foreclosure Alternatives Program, which we uh, call HAMP, um, which helps individuals refinance, obtain modifications, and even for those folks who are willing to, um, uh, who are facing foreclosure but don't want all the negative consequences associated with foreclosure, it helps them uh, go through with a, a sale of their home, which may not be for the full value of the house, and provides them with about $3,000 to help them move to a more affordable housing. I should also say today that just today the administration announced another round of the hardest hit fund, which was $600 million that goes to uh, state, five states, which will again provide resources for those states to help with individuals who are facing foreclosure. I think if you see in cities like Baltimore, Detroit, when you get abandoned houses, it brings crime, deteriorates the neighborhood, and everyone else's property value goes down, and then they can't loan out. So, and it's uh, what will this do to, for cities like them for to, to get people back in these houses? Because it seems like everyone's losing out. The banks are losing out because they're not getting money. The people are losing out because they don't have a place to stay, and everyone else in the neighborhood's losing out because their neighborhood, which a lot of proud neighborhoods have turned to abandoned houses, which is drugs, crime, and you know, that doesn't reflect well in the cities, the neighborhoods, or the people. So is there anything that could be done to bring people back into these houses and to bring these neighborhoods back? Um, well, as I mentioned, the, the Neighborhood Stabilization Fund was a fund that was created to help communities um, at either you're gonna 
tear down some of the buildings that have been abandoned so they don't become magnets for crime um, or find other ways to rehabilitate those homes which have been abandoned um, and those buildings have been abandoned. Uh, you know, I think the, the, the president is focused on jobs, jobs, jobs. He says his first, second, and third priorities are jobs, jobs, jobs. Fundamentally, we need to get folks back to work so that they can stay in their homes or come back and can afford the mortgages and the rents that go with those homes. In the meantime, we have this, this array of programs which do not go nearly far enough, and I, I, I grant you that. I think the administration completely understands that as well. Yeah. But it's, the, it's, a, it's a big effort because we recognize the problem, and these are ways to help individuals refinance, obtain modifications, um, and otherwise uh, try to, to stay in their homes. Or I think in Detroit, the thing of turning some of the abandoned houses into farmlands, which mm -hmm. might mm -hmm. create jobs and right. things stuff. So is mm -hmm. there any type of stuff in the bill that could help that out or bring, bring new well, jobs as well? this, because I think we've, we've exhausted that one. So we'll, we'll come back to that. John, let's take another one of your uh, reader questions that were submitted to you. Okay. A lot of our audience wants to know, okay, I'm a regular bank customer. I have a checking account at the bank and I have my Roth IRA through that, through that institution as well. How will this bill that I hear is being, it's being portrayed as a sort of Wall Street, big institution, regulation bill, how will that affect me, just a regular bank customer? What's gonna be different? So, the good news is you shouldn't notice much difference at all. Uh, you will still have your checking account and your Roth IRA and your mortgage through your bank. Uh, but you should see some differences. The form should be easier to read. Uh, it should be no longer possible for your bank to automatically enroll you in overdraft protection program that you may not have wanted to do that's going to again result in hidden fees and hidden costs. Uh, and when you're renegotiating your mortgage, again, the mortgage form should be simpler, et cetera. So I, really what you have at your back is uh, additional consumer protection. But for the, I think for most customers, they will not notice a difference. But just having a little more added security that our financial system uh, should, not, should never again bring down or at least have the threat of bringing down the rest of the economy. The fact that things will be easier to use is, I think, a big a big That's deal. Right. Easier to read and understand, Completely. I think, is, is huge. Clarity and confidence in the system is very, very That's important. Right. Absolutely. Dr. Leon, what do you have for us? Uh, Shay Oliveira asks, will the president support bills that support credit unions? Uh, credit unions are nonprofits that are much more consumer friendly. Big banks have the money to stop many bills that support credit unions. Mm -hmm. But credit unions are outside of the normal banking process. Uh, facilities that a number of people use uh, uh, as opposed to going to the standard large large bank. So how does that, how does that, how do credit unions play into, uh, into this process? Uh, so let me just, I am a member of a credit union um, and uh, I very much appreciate the credit union being there and the services that I obtain from the credit union. And this administration is solidly behind credit unions. We understand that they play a very special role uh, in their communities, that they are especially help those in their field of membership. Uh, and because of their special status and their importance, they also have tax exempt status. Uh, what I would say is this administration has been working very hard to find ways to provide access to those who, have, who lack access to other financial institutions. And um, uh, credit unions play an important role, as do community development financial institutions as well. And uh, Casey, why don't we take your next uh, okay. question? We have a question from Ronnie B. from Jack and Joe Politics. Uh, he says, approximately 25% of Americans now have a credit score that is below 600. A majority of those have been African Americans. That means if, when, the economy comes back to life, we will still be lagging in net worth and the accumulation of wealth. Will the Wall Street reform finally do away with the sham of consumer credit scoring? Um, well, the, the, the law itself does not do away with credit scoring. However, the law provides a much clearer way to help individuals build, maintain, and rebuild their credit. It does so by helping you not get into the trouble in the first place with, again, as we've said, much clearer forms um, so that you understand you won't get trapped by the fine print. It does so by uh, clamping down on unfair lending practices so that you don't find yourself with uh, a mortgage with a balloon payment due at the end of the term or where there are hidden uh, interest rate hikes during the term of the loan um, so that before you know it you can't afford this loan which you thought looked pretty uh, completely affordable at the beginning. 
um, and that it also brings in the financial literacy, again, to help individuals not get into trouble in the first place, and to help provide options for how to rebuild your credit um, as you go along as well. So the, right now, if a consumer has a problem with one of the credit reporting agencies, an issue with, uh, you know, something's wrong on their credit report, they go to the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, FTC.gov, you file a, a complaint. In the future, will they go to this, uh, this future bureau or will the FTC still be the place to file the complaint? My understanding would be they would go to the new bureau. Okay. All right, and Dr. Leon? We'll take a question from uh, online here in one second. You go oh, ahead. Yeah, um, I'm not sure who this question came from, but it, it has to do with uh, underbanking. According to a recent uh, FDIC study, uh, certain racial and ethnic minorities are more likely to be in communities that are underbanked or non-banked. Uh, minorities are more likely to be underbanked. Uh, blacks, an estimated 31.6 percent. Hispanics, 24 percent. Is there anything in the legislation that deals with underbanking? Because that, in many instances, drives people to uh, payday lenders and alternative sources. Uh, to deal with very minimal financial needs, check cashing and those types of things, anything that's going to help address underbanking or non-banked communities? So the legislation is designed to protect consumers who are in the banking um, communities. Uh, at the same time, the, with the, the Bureau, with the Consumer Bureau, Financial Protection Bureau, it was also designed to help with some of these non-bank activities, the payday lending, I should also just mention that for the first time, remittances for immigrants who are sending remittances home, they've never been regulated. They, are, they will also be brought, brought under the umbrella of the Bureau so that individuals will have information and disclosure about the present transactional fees, et cetera. Um, however, really, this is through this other effort uh, that the Treasury Department in particular has taken the lead and the administration certainly uh, very much uh, wants to help those who have uh, less, of, um, less access to the regular banking sector through CDFIs and um, credit unions to find ways to get uh, individuals who don't have as strong of an access to bank accounts um, better access to credit. And we have uh, a question that has just come in to us online. Uh, it has to do with student loans. And the, uh, the question has to do with, I am currently in college, going to have crazy debt when I get out of college. What is this, uh, what are these new reforms doing for me and helping me prepare to pay back those bills? Uh, well, this law itself will help you pay back to the extent that those student loans are not federal student loans, uh, but are from the private sector, uh, it will ensure that you are not uh, caught up in some sort of deceptive um, where, scheme whereby the private lender is increasing your interest rates as you're trying to repay them, et cetera. So student loans are definitely on the purview um, and will have un under the oversight of the new Consumer Protection Bureau. But the, the administration is uh, very aware of the burden that student loans place on individuals and uh, has been looking for ways to, to expand. We've expanded Pell Grants uh, so that students have more access to, to Pell Grants, which do not need to be repaid. But we've also um, broadened and strengthened our uh, income-based repayment plans where in individuals no longer have to pay more than I think currently it's 15 or 20 percent of their income. So if your student loan comprises more than 15 or 20 percent of your income, uh, then you will not have to pay any more than that. Uh, there, that currently exists for individuals going into certain fields such as um, uh, nursing, certain shortage fields such as nursing and um, health and teaching. However, that will also be broadened starting in the year 2013-2014 to include all students. So we're very much aware of the, the potential impact that student loans have on individuals. And I'll just keep coming back to the other, the other thing that we really have to keep our eye on is that it's important that all, under, all of us understand when we sign on to these loans, which are just so, credit is so much more available today than it was 30, 40 years ago. And it's just so important for us all to understand just what our, our responsibilities with regard to these loans. And we'll go back to, uh, to the online set again. Uh, this one is from uh, Mark, who is preparing to buy a home. He's actually looking for a home. And he's asking, uh, one, is this a good time to look? I don't know if we can answer that question. <laughs> uh, but two, uh, I want to recommend real estate. Right, right. <laughs> 
Where's the bookie? But two, uh, when I go in to uh, sign the final documents, what should I expect under this new law? You're just looking for a house now. So if you're going in now, I think you'll expect that no, there has not been all of the changes that we will see as the law was just passed uh, two or three weeks ago on July 21st. And um, the, the, as, we've, as we've said, the Consumer Bureau has not been stood up. And when forms are changed, uh, it takes some time in order to make those changes. So um, unfortunately, I don't think that you'll see uh, major changes uh, just today, but certainly within the next year or two, I think it, it'll be a much easier process. All right. Uh, Casey, why don't we go back and take one of your questions? OK, this question is from Shanti, also from Jack and Joe Politics. The creation of the Office of Minority and Women Inclusion, what does this entail? So um, these are offices which uh, will be required to exist in all of the agencies uh, that currently oversee financial, um, financial institutions, all the regulatory agencies, as well as the Federal Reserve Board here in Washington and all of the Federal Reserve, regional Federal Reserve banks. And the purpose of these offices is to ensure that these institutions, which uh, really have to represent all Americans, in themselves have adequate diversity in their staff, and that they are adequately considering the needs of, of all Americans. And so uh, that's, what these, that's what these offices will entail. Okay. So they'll be pasted, posted in agencies throughout the Washington area? Not just what, the, the regional banks as well, so okay. all over the country. Fantastic. Uh, John, when we take another one of yours. So at Black Enterprise, we have a very diverse uh, audience. And some of our, our readers and, and viewers happen to be people in the financial industry. Sure. Mm -hmm. If I'm a, a, you know, I've heard from a lot of people in the, in the financial industry. If I'm a person running a small investment firm, let's mm -hmm. say, what are the new, what are these new financial protections mean for me? Am I going to have to hire? a bunch of lawyers and a bunch of writers who can simplify these, uh, these forms that I've had on hand for forever? What, how's, how's life going to be different change. for me? Well, the good news is, as long as you're playing by the rules and you're good to your customers, your life will change uh, very little. However, it is true that through this law, the SEC has broader authorities. Um, and so they have broader authorities to go after those investment break brokers that are not looking out for the best interests of their clients. And that's ultimately, that's important at the end of the day. We want to make sure that people have the opportunity to, to earn a living and run a good business, but at the same time that they're fair to their customers at the end of the day. So that's a win-win for everybody, that's ultimately exactly is what right. we're looking for. Dr. Will. Uh, Elaine Robinson asks, what law or laws or legislation will be put in place to ensure that Wall Street does not cause the American working class to collapse again. Who's looking out for the average working person? And, and let me, if I could just kind of tag on to that, I think one of the issues with this whole campaign is getting people in the country to understand exactly how this is going to impact their daily lives uh, and, and what this is really going to mean to them at the dinner table at the end of the day. You know, I think that's, I think that's exactly right. And it's, it's one of these things where the whole purpose of the bill actually is to protect everyday um, workers and consumers of these financial products, everyday people with mortgages, with credit cards, with bank accounts um, that potentially have these hidden fees. Um, uh, those individuals who go to payday lenders. So it's actually designed to make sure that the system is working. Um, it, the, the incentives in the system are aligned with the incentives of the customer. Um, and yet, because that seem, it can seem very arcane, it can feel very removed when really that was the whole, mm -hmm. the whole focus mm -hmm. is, on, is on the consumer. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that was a, a key uh, principle for any reform uh, for at least for the president, was that never again could there be financial institutions that were too big to fail. Because it was in having institutions that were too big to fail, and was also in having regulatory agencies that were not really watching the, watching the store. 
Um, uh, there were some, there were overlapping authorities and some banks could shop for regulators uh, and sort of get the best deal. And so uh, the whole purpose was to streamline that, make it that we, that, um, that there was a, a much clear understanding of, of these financial institutions. So let me just describe a, some, a few of the ways in which we, uh, this law is designed not to make it that Wall Street brings down Main Street. Um, one is there's a very aggressive advance warning system. There's a committee which is chaired by the Secretary of Treasury, which will have authority to be overseeing the largest banks and the largest institutions um, and to be monitoring them. Uh, these institutions have to uh, be providing what they're calling living wills, so a way for them to be unwound, in other words, a way to let them fail without the requiring taxpayer dollars. Um, but allowed for them, allowed for in an orderly way so that it's not so disruptive to the rest of the economy. Um, it requires these banks to have more capital and um, leverage requirements so that if they do come into financial trouble and have some assets on their balance sheets, which they can't really afford, they have a cushion so that, again, they don't run into trouble. So it's like having enough money in your savings account so that if you have a rainy day, um, it's, you don't just have to declare bankruptcy. Um, it updates the Fed's authority to provide system-wide support in the event that we do, we do need it. Um, and again, it establishes rigorous standards and supervision of all these institutions. So the idea is really to, again, we're not going to be able to foresee the next scheme that will come down the pike in another five years. Um, but the point is to be able to have people with enough view into the system that we may not have thought of the system uh, or of this scheme, but we can analyze it and consider its risk and minimize any potential adverse um, effects on the, on the rest of the system. Absolutely. Thank you for that. And this is going to be our final question. Unfortunately, we'll take it from one of our, um, from one of our viewers online. Uh, Andre Hatchett says, uh, what are the best ways to get funding for my small business if I have bad personal credit and I can create jobs? Um, or can I create jobs, I think is what he meant to say. How can I get funding for this? Thank you. Uh, Dr. Rouse? Well, I would, if you're a small business, I would recommend the small business, the SBA, the Small Business uh, Agency? Small Business, business Administration. Administration. Right. administration. Right. The Small Business Administration, which has a variety of um, loan programs and a variety of, they have, um, um, uh, they have uh, counseling centers all across the country. Uh, to really help small businesses to, to answer these sorts of questions and to help you really understand what kind of financing is available to help you. Because we very much understand that small businesses are the engine of the economy and uh, they, uh, it's very important in, their, and in this, in this uh, economic uh, recession. Uh, access to credit has been one of the biggest barriers to growth and so I think it's very important uh, and we do have the resources available through the SBA and, and they're there to help you. I want to give a pitch to one more organization as well, that's the Minority <gasps> Develop you. Business Development Agency right. as well, mm -hmm. which is the part of the uh, Department of Commerce that specializes in dealing with building minority businesses and they have uh, regional offices all over the country that you can tap into as well. Uh, and so with that, that will be our last question for the afternoon. I want to thank Dr. Cecilia Rouse of the Council of Economic Advisors for joining us this afternoon, as well as our partners in this, uh, in this endeavor, Dr. Uh, Leon Wilmer with the, uh, with the Griot.com and with uh, Howard University. Thank you for being here. My pleasure. John Simons with Black Enterprise. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Casey, thank you as, uh, very much as well for being with us from Jack and Jill. All of you, this is a terribly important issue uh, that we will continue to work on diligently as we've talked about this afternoon. We will be working to stand up the Consumer Protection Financial Board here very soon and we'll continue to work diligently on handling all of these issues to make sure that the, the playing field is even and that you have the rights and protections that you deserve. Thank you all very much for participating today. We appreciate your time. And uh, Dr. Rouse, did you have any final words? No, I just would like to echo what you've said. This is very important legislation. It affects us all. And uh, I hope that this has been helpful. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, partners. And uh, you all enjoy the rest of your day. Take care.